the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore the judgment comes forth, perverted. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So Advent is a time of expectant waiting and, and preparation. The word literally comes from Adventus in Latin, which, which means coming. In Old Testament times, the Jewish people prepared for centuries for the coming of the Messiah. And as Christians, we believe that the Messiah came 2,000 years ago, which leads to the question, what are we waiting for now? If he's already come, what are we waiting for? Well, in this series, we're going to be looking at that world that was waiting for the Messiah yet to come. What were the basic issues? What were the basic longings and yearnings of that world? By the end of Advent, hopefully, then, we'll be in a better situation to assess, well, what was fulfilled in Jesus? And perhaps what is yet to be fulfilled. Now, throughout fall, we've been tracking the narrative lectionary, the great stories of the Old Testament, which will continue after Christmas, into the stories of the New, Christ, uh, of the New Testament. Um, for Advent, they chose the first story to be, uh, or the text, for, 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 to be coming from Habakkuk, uh, which is curious because uh, in contrast to a number of the prophetic books which were are believed to contain sneak previews of the coming of the Messiah, predictions of his coming. Uh, Habakkuk uh, has never been seen to contain uh, any of these. But I think their choice of Habakkuk was brilliant. For Habakkuk gives us a very clear vision of a world that was in need of a Messiah. It gives us a very clear vision of a world of yearning, yearning. Did he hear the yearning in his words? Not just even yearning um, like, oh, I wish that one day justice would be fulfilled, but actually yearning that's so deep, it's actually spilled over into rage. And not just rage at anyone like people who are doing injustice, but rage at God. Do you hear those words? Oh Lord, how long shall I cry out for help and you will not listen? will cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. We're used to hearing Old Testament prophets tell the people, get your act together. Habakkuk is telling God, get your act together. There's a world of yearning. Like his contemporary, prophetic contemporary, Jeremiah, both of whom preached in the late 7th century uh, BCE, Habakkuk was just absolutely vexed and to the point of exhaustion over the injustice that he saw committed by his own people. In his day, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. In fact, not only that, but the, the, the wealthy and the powerful were exploiting the most vulnerable in society. And the very legal system and religious system that was established as a safety net and as, as a protection mechanism against such injustice had completely come unglued in their eyes. And they were tired of seeing it happen, tired
tired of praying every day for change and seeing nothing. How could an all-powerful, loving God simply sit by and watch as these things happened? A few weeks ago, when Chris was preaching, she invited uh, uh, the congregation to fill out on a piece of paper uh, those questions that are really nagging us uh, right now, uh, the, to which they would, people would like an answer. Uh, someone wrote down uh, this, the Epicurean paradox. I'm sure that was on everyone's mind. <laughs> what is the Epicurean paradox? Actually, a pretty, uh, it actually may just be on your mind may not have had a name for it. The Epicurean paradox stems from the philosopher Epicurus, who uh, was in Athens about three centuries after uh, Habakkuk, in the late fourth century BCE. And, according, and Epicurus was looking out at the world and its understandings of God, and said basically this, that if, uh, given that there is the presence of evil in the world, then God cannot be simultaneously all-powerful and loving. Because there's evil, then God can be, you know, might be all-powerful, but then must not be loving because God's not willing to do something about it. Or God could be loving, like willing to do something about it, but not all-powerful, not able to do anything about it. So according to Epicurus, I mean, given the presence of real evil in the world, there is really either no God at all, or at least no God worthy of our devotion, because either God wants to do something for us, but can't, or can do something for us, but won't. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to blame someone for wondering if there is a God, or wondering if there is a God of justice in our modern world. I mean, as, you, as we look out around, can't we see many of the same things that Habakkuk was crying out for still with us? How is it that, that, that for instance, in the developing countries that need the most health care, access to health care, they tend to have the least access to that health care? How can we still have the situation where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and a legal system that seems to not quite uh, be about justice right now? As we look out around us, how can we see you know, a group like ISIS, which represents authentic Islam about as closely as the Nazis represent authentic Christianity, parading around the Middle East, brutalizing and killing people in God's name, and God just sits back and watches? Really? How can any of us not wonder about either God's love or God's power or God's very existence now and again? Well, Habakkuk lived in a world that is not so different from our own, with very similar stresses to one's conception of what's right and what's and, and, and how, why, why is God, where is God, how is God in the world? And one of the things that Habakkuk paints clearly for us is that faithfulness includes not just offering our praise to God, and Habakkuk does praise God, but faithfulness also includes offering God our rage, our rage. Good people of faith have a hard time uh, with the, that, that concept of raging at God, complaining at God, accusing God of failure to act in, in a certain way. But bear in mind, if that's troubling to you, that we find the writings of Habakkuk not in some dusty journal in some used bookstore someplace, but in the sacred scriptures. Those who compiled the scriptures felt that this is an important word for us. Rage at God, don't just praise at God. And it wasn't just Habakkuk we find in the scriptures doing this. His contemporary, Jeremiah, was in many ways a better rager even than Habakkuk. 
several times in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah accuses God of one thing or another. Finally, in chapter 20, he basically explodes, even daring to swear at God. Yes, to swear at God. In chapter 20, he says, God, you have screwed me. Now, you're not going to find that if you go to chapter 20. (laughs) Because translators of our Bibles don't think that you and I can handle such language. They water it down make it more kind of off the side. They'll say, you've deceived me, or you've enticed me. But the word in Hebrew is very clear, and its best rendering is, you have screwed me. I'm tired of proclaiming a message in your name when you don't seem to be doing nothing. So quit it. You've deceived me. You've screwed me. Well, It doesn't make you wonder, like, why God doesn't just, like, strike people like Jeremiah and Habakkuk down? Why are they in sacred scripture? My guess is it's because those who compiled scripture had a deep intuition about how God responds to offers of rage. Not with the, the temptation to hit the smite button on these people but rather sees in the words of Habakkuk, in the words of Jeremiah, these words of frustration, that they're doing something that Epicurus never thought to do. Epicurus wasn't raging at God. Epicurus concluded there must not be a God or not be a God worthy of devotion. No, they raged at God because they believed in an all-powerful, loving God. Even as they then asked God to, well, be God then. But their rage betrays their underlying belief. You can do something about this, and I know you want to. So why aren't you? Why don't I see signs of you doing it? I suspect their rage also betrays their basic trust that God listens. That God actually is listening to them in their rage. Why wouldn't they, why would they rage if they didn't think that God was there listening? And I also suspect that they, that that God also sees in their rage a deep trust in God's basic humility, compassion, and love. That God isn't going to simply wipe them out for getting frustrated at at God. No, rage is, is a critical piece of faithfulness. It may feel uncomfortable, but it's supposed to be there. You know, decades ago, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross demonstrated that in any grieving process, like when a person's died or or, um, or, or somebody's experienced great loss, there are five stages of grief. There's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression, and then there's acceptance. Notice that step two, anger. Why did you let this person leave me? Why did you leave me so soon? What could I have done? Anger, it's part of the natural process. You don't get to acceptance until you first go through the deep valley of anger. It's not that anger is a final word then. It's simply a stage in the process. It's supposed to be there. Feelings, you know, they don't ask if they're right or wrong. They just feel. (coughs) If we don't clear things up now and again and just simply offer God our feelings, then our praise really has a certain emptiness to it. No, the presence of Jeremiah and Habakkuk in our scriptures is like God saying, I'm listening. Tell me how you really feel not just what you think I want to hear. I'm more interested in your honesty than your flattery. I'm more interested in authentic relationship than pretend piety. So tell me how you really feel, and we'll go from there. We'll go from there. Have you ever noticed how sometimes we just need somebody to listen to our, our feelings of hurt and betrayal. That may, maybe that's not going to solve everything, but it's a start. I mean, do you ever have those days where you just kind of go, Grah! 
okay, uh, next thing. <laughs> you, know, you just kind of have to. <laughs> what is it that goes on? <laughs> Sometimes we just need to even overhear ourselves in our rage. We're far better if we understand there's a God that bears witness to our pain, even though it's not the final word, even though ultimately we have this deep intuition we're not going to be mad at God, but still God's got to hear how we feel. 20 years almost of counseling and ministry, one of the deep connectors of most every <laughs> situation has been an essential experience of why bad things happen to good people or why Good things happen to bad people. And one of the biggest blocks to moving creatively in a situation is the stifling of anger. Even the stifling of anger towards God. Again, we may not, we know we're not ultimately going to say, well, God, you're the problem here. But sometimes, you know, when there's been a betrayal, Maybe an infidelity, or maybe there's been a, uh, an, uh, a, an unjustified firing, or your bank account has just you know, gone with the stock market <laughs> crashing, or what, whatever, what have you. You may not ultimately think, well, God caused that. But all of us down deep under still have an idea that, you know what, you created this world, God. You created the possibility for this to happen to me. Why? Why? Can you allow it if you love me and you have the power to do something about it? Before moving on, what if you were to find the one thing that vexes you the most in this world, that gives you the most reason to doubt God's power and love? What is it that challenges you when you look out at the world most about God's existence? Can you find the one thing that challenges you most? Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights to the choir master with stringed instruments. The 13th century uh, of our era, Islamic mystic uh, Rumi tells a story about a man who said his prayers every night. Every night he, he, he moaned and complained, prayed to God to solve the injustices of the world. Until one day a cynic said, well, um, what does God tell you? He immediately stopped his prayers, ceased praying at all. Until one night Allah came to him in the form of an angel who said, why did you cease praying? He responded, because I never received an answer. To which the angel responded, this longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Habakkuk, Jeremiah, they understood what Rumi understood. That it is an act of faith to cry out, to yearn mightily for a better world. And as even an act of faith, they get frustrated with God for not seeing it. That frustration, believe it or not, is part of the connection that we have to God. And God, amazingly, moves in this world through God's love dogs. Do you ever hear that story of the man who cried out over a particular situation of injustice to God, saying, why don't you do something about this? And God responded, but I have responded. I sent you into the world. I sent you. Raging is a faithful response to the injustices of the world. But it also puts the prayer at risk because it's also a challenge to the faithful. That thing that you identified just moments ago as being the most challenging to you and your belief in an all-powerful, loving God, that one thing, could it be that God has put you here, sent you into this world to make a response to it, to be part of God's response to the world? I mean, why was that particular thing your issue? Likely the person sitting next to you, it wasn't theirs. Some other issue was. Why are you so worked up about it? Could it be that in those feelings of rage, contains your very connection, most intimate connection, to spirit? There's something about offering our, that kind of naked truth to God that changes something, that actually makes it, produces changes in us that go beyond ourselves and start to change the world around us. They produce a change such that while Habakkuk starts his book raging at God, he ends his book offering one of the most beautiful pieces of praise in all of Scripture. Praise yet without the fulfillment that he was looking for. Do you hear those words just now? The Chris read, though the fig tree does not blossom 
and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Sometimes we don't need to see complete fulfillment of our desires, of our yearnings. We just need to experience movement towards it. And when we offer our rage and God then invests us with the power to be part of that movement, we experience that movement quite directly. And it gives us that patience endurance that Habakkuk experienced. To go on and to live in hope, real hope, even as the fruits of our labors are far, far off. This whole book of Habakkuk really came to a head over the last several months in a very real way, in concrete way, in our world in Ferguson, Missouri. Certainly a place where we need a lot of God's love dogs working. I wonder in Ferguson what would happen if the words and the wisdom of Habakkuk were more fully realized, not just in them, but in the world around who is wrestling with the issues that Ferguson really opened up once again. Or in that one act on August 9th, the guilt or innocence of the people involved are still very much under dispute. We found and experienced our country something like a volcanic eruption of rage. It had far less to do with that one incident than it did about generations of racial prejudice. In the debate that followed, you know, more details of what happened on August 9th came out that led many who had raged before to question just, you know, was this really a black and white situation of injustice or was there more to the story and so forth? Many people who complained about the protesters said, hey, the person was innocent, the officer was innocent, you need to get over it and move on. But I wonder what Habakkuk would say to those who feel the protests were not necessary. Could Habakkuk perhaps be suggesting that there's a real missed opportunity here if we simply conclude, oh, the officer may have been innocent. Of course, that's still under his view, but if we conclude that, that there's nothing to worry about. I wonder if Habakkuk might tell us, listen. Listen to that raw rage. And if the protests trouble you, what if you saw them a little bit differently than you're doing? What if instead of concluding that the people who are protesting want no relationship with white people or are condemning America as hopelessly racist, what if you saw what's really going on? That there would be no protests. There wasn't a deep intuition that there's someone listening that in what we or some will consider to be a condemnation of America, there is actually a deep belief in America being expressed. That America is a land of justice. That it is a land of opportunity. So let's act like it. What if instead of hearing, I want no relationship with white people, hearing, I want a deeper relationship <laughs> with white people. And what if those on the other side of the divide could look at those who were in the counter-protest and of simply hearing them or concluding they are saying, we want a segregated society, what if they could hear their cries or their intuitions that our country needs to be a country of justice for all people? 
I think Habakkuk would suggest that if we would just listen to each other and not condemn each other for whether they're right or wrong, but just listen to the feelings, that that might be a good start. Maybe if we would listen to each other, perhaps we would hear underneath the words a new power at work, a power at work that will one day give us the fortitude and endurance to join Habakkuk. Though the fig tree of racial harmony does not blossom and no fruit of justice is on the vines, though the produce of the olive of peace fails and the fields of opportunity yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold of national unity and there is no herd in the stalls of compassion and love, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. God makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he makes me tread upon the heights. Why? Because God sent you and me into the world to be love dogs. Amen.